My name is Jerry, I'm from Wild Eye, and this is episode 11 of our wildlife photography Q&A videos. Now it's been um, a nice and busy time the last couple of weeks. Just came back from Big Cats, fought for my life having tick bite fever, and now I'm in the office for about two, three, almost four weeks now before my next trip, which means a lot of content, which is awesome. Now, one of the things that helps me generate this content is if you guys ask me those questions. Anything to do with wildlife photography, but in next week, I'm um, in the whole week, so I'm going to try and do three episodes. One of them I'm hoping to do is, um, is, is, is based just on Lightroom and post-processing for wildlife photography. So here's how it's going to work. If you have any questions on Lightroom, processing, Photoshop, whatever, your wildlife photography images, I need you to send me an email at this address with the subject, Jerry, please answer my question. And then inside that email, if you want to attach an image to describe what you want, to, want me to answer, or then um, just give me a question of what it is in Lightroom and post-processing for wildlife photography that I can answer for you. I think it's quite a nice one because, I mean, in Lightroom courses, we've got a digital photography course here at the office tomorrow. It comes up again and again and again. People are not sure how far to push the saturation. What does the black and white slider do? Whatever. Send me those questions and I will answer them for you purely from a Lightroom point of view. I want to do like a whole bunch of small snippets um, in these Q&A videos on, on this specific episode and do like minute and a half, two minute answers on Lightroom to try and fit in as many as I can in about a 15, 20 minute episode. Let's see how that goes. I'll give you the details again at the end of this episode. Um, otherwise, nice and busy, it's Friday today, so um, yeah, just getting stuck in, hey? Business-wise, going well, but it's head down and looking forward. But for now, let's get to your questions. Let's go. Weston asks, how would I get a job in wildlife photography? Weston, I decided to take this question because it is one that I get asked a lot. I mean, I've probably got about four or five emails from the last two weeks in my inbox, people asking how do they get into the guiding and wildlife photography industry. We'll chat more about that a bit later. But let me try this analogy just before I get into this. My previous career industry was in the fitness, health and wellness, fitness industry. So people would ask, how do I get a job in the fitness industry? Here's the thing. You can be a personal trainer, an aerobics instructor, a CrossFit coach, a gymnastics coach, you can train kids, you can train pregnant women. There are so many different spheres within the fitness industry. You can go even further then. You can say, right, do you want to coach people at their homes or at a gym? Do you want to do this as an online expert and create data and knowledge online? Um, do you want to go into nutrition? Do you want to train competitive athletes? It never stops. Now, the wildlife photography industry is exactly the same. So when someone asks me, how do I get into the wildlife photography industry or world? Again, what is it that you want to do? It's very few people, and I said this in one of the beginning episodes, there's very few people out there who just, just do wildlife photography. Going to live in the bush for six years and just take pictures of cool animals sounds romantic, but it's not sustainable. In these days, it's not sustainable. And those guys would make money off the images they get. Now, every Tom, Dick, and Harry has a camera, and they're pushing out stock and Facebook images and whatever all the time. So, is it possible? Hell yes, it's absolutely possible, but you have to decide for yourself what it is that you want to do. Do you want to take people into the field? That's a guiding thing. Do you want to just create images? That you can do in your off time. You can do that with whatever job you're doing currently, and you can then get involved. I mean, you've got a nine to five, I'm assuming, yes? You can come home, spend time with the dogs, the kids, the wife, the husband, and another two hours in the evening, process your images and start building something for yourself online. It's possible, but you have to, you can't just say, what do I want to do in wildlife photography? I just want to take wildlife images. Yeah, big whoop, everybody does. So what is it exactly that you want to do? Once you can isolate that for yourself, the decision as to how to get there is going to be a hell of a lot easier. And a lot of thoughts on that. So if Western, if you go and sit down and you, you understand and you can be honest with yourself as to what it is that you want to do within the industry, then ask me that question again, please. It'd be a great one to dig in further. I mean, yes, you can do a little bit of everything. You can do a little bit of fine art prints here. You can, fine art print, everybody seems to be doing fine art prints now. So you make an image black and white and it's fine art. Uh, not so much, but you can. Do some fine art prints on the side. Create a little blog for yourself where you get your images out and you teach people stuff. Great way for you to start thinking about your own work as well. Um, get friends, take them to the bush. Help them to take images, great, great images, put it back on the blog, sell some prints. There's many ways you can link this thing together, but 
How do you get your job in wildlife photography? First off, first decision is decide what it is that you want and then start chasing it. Anant, hi, do you have any idea of underwater wildlife photography? And can you please explain about filters and polarizers? Anant, mm, what's the easiest way to do this? No, I have no idea about underwater photography. Quite honestly, it kind of scares me a bit. The underwater idea, uh, I've done some snorkeling and things like that, but never with a camera. And yeah, I'm not comfortable underwater. I dig it, but it's not, I'm not comfortable. So there's, um, I spoke to Andrew yesterday as well about the um, a, uh, uh, underwater, land, underwater landscape photographer. A, an underwater photographer that came to the office. His name is Alan Walker. Alan Walker, hey? Yeah. Alan Walker, yes. I'm going to put a link to his website underneath this on the YouTube channel. So hit him up. Um, as, far, as far as I know, he is one of the best guys to help you out. I mean, the, and the idea of underwater shooting with light bending through water, I know there's particles drifting, so if you pop a flash underwater, which you have to have, all these strobes and things, those are going to throw back light at you, so it's going to create almost like a dust body effect. I don't know. Uh, short version? No, I have no idea. But on filters and polarizers, we can talk a little bit. The, the thing is this, Anant, is that with, with Photoshop and all these new, every time the new Creative Cloud Photoshop version gets released, they just adding new things and new things, and there's very few filters, the old school filters, the round ones, all the squares that you drop in in front of the lens, that you cannot mimic within Photoshop, or the digital world at least. So... Uh, f f f the application thereof for wildlife photography isn't as big as, for example, something like landscape, where what the filter would do, for example, a piece of square glass, yes? It's dark at the top and then it fades to normal glass at the bottom. So at the top, it allows less light and at the bottom, more. So if I'm shooting a landscape where my, excuse me, my sky is overly bright and the foreground is dark, I slide that on top. And because of the way the glass lets light through, it's an easier exposure, and you don't burn out the brights or lose the darks. So for, for, for landscape, there's definitely applications for it. But like I said, you could do those things in filters after the fact. I know Andrew and I spoke about it last year in the Mara, for example, to play with something like that for a, for a crossing. If animals are going to cross the Mara River, uh, animals, wildebeest more specifically, then for you to set up, put a neutral density filter, a grad filter that stops the light from coming in, allowing you to shoot shutter speed of like, I don't know, 30 minutes, which could create an interesting blurred effect. But I mean, haven't played with it yet, just an idea. The circular polarizer, however, that is quite a bit of fun. What you could do there is, or what, how it works, it's, it's a circular polarizer, a circular filter that screws onto the front of the lens, and once it's screwed on, the whole thing can rotate. Yeah, it rotates around. Now how it works, if you can imagine, there's a whole bunch of slots of lines like this. As you rotate that circular polarizer, they line up and allow certain light to come through while not allowing other light to come through. Normally how it works is, you're looking at me now, so the light that's reflecting off me is coming straight into the camera. Yep, pretty simple. But there's also other surface light that's bouncing. For example, it might bounce off my phone from here at a different angle into the front of the lens. Now those, that light will get cut out. That's why a circular polarizer is great to cut out reflections from water, from windows, even from clouds. That's why if you, look, if you use a polarizer and you rotate that front, um, especially if you've got a blue sky with white clouds, you'll see how it changes based on what kind of light the polarizer is allowing in based on where you've rotated it to. Very handy. Now, just a short one. If you do play with this and it's very much worth it, is if I'm taking a photograph of you, the optimal polarization will happen if my light source, or the sun, if I'm shooting you, comes from 90 degrees from where I'm shooting, and is slightly up, about 30, 35 degrees up. That kind of angle, if I'm photographing this direction, would be the best result. Now, circular polarizer, I'm sure some Photoshop guru has tried to mimic it, but that's one of the few things, like I said, you cannot mimic digitally uh, after the fact. So circular polarizer, funny enough, I always have one in my bag, uh, never really get time to play with it. I mean, once in a while, I might take it out and take one or two. But definitely, try the polarizer. Um, if you're looking at an purely wildlife, eh, not much of a use for filters. UV filters, oh, UV filters I get asked about often is, should I have a UV filter on front of my lens? I don't use them. Because a UV filter is just to protect scratches and stuff from the front, but it's an extra layer of glass the light has to travel through. So depending on the quality that you've purchased, it's, it could degrade the quality of your image. We're nitpicking here now, but that's the argument that most people have. What about scratches then? That's why I use my hoods. You know the lens hood? Uh, on some lenses, 
it's quite a big one on the 600s, but on other ones, it's a hood that screws off, turns around, and you put it on the front. That, for me, protects my lens enough. So UV filters, haven't used them in years and years and years. Um, polarizer, definitely play with. Murray asks, Hi, Jerry. Is there a place for an off-camera flash in an African wildlife photographer's bag? For example, for full flash. If so, when should it be used and when should it not be used? Murray, great question because this is something some, well, not some, a lot of people have been asking is flash and full flash for wildlife photography. So is there a place for a, for a flash in an African wildlife photographer's bag? Yes, I do believe there is. It's normally not the first thing I'll put in to the bag, but um, it's, it's definitely something I always think of. Now, how does it work and why would you do it? There's a couple of things. Number one, off-camera flash, let's just get on the same page here for everybody, is if you have a small camera or DSLR and you click the shutter and you pop the flash, yes, that's attached. And off-camera flash is those flash units, a speed light, which get put on top of the camera, which shoots in either there, or you can disconnect it and shoot it off-camera, either a little bracket that you can shoot. So if my lens is here, the camera, the flash will go from here, or then I can disconnect it and trigger it remotely, shooting it from different angles. Now, the, the, the one very restrictive thing, Murray, with shooting flash in African wildlife is can you work the sighting sufficiently to make use of what the flash can do for you? Now, if you're self-driving, it's very difficult to kind of maneuver, drive, drive, drive. If you're on a normal safari with people who don't understand the photographic process and what you're trying to achieve, it's going to be difficult for them to say, okay, hold my flash here, do this, can we wait forward, move back, and so on, because it's very specific angles and stuff that you're looking for. On a photo safari, if it's a dedicated trip that's going to be looking at that kind of photography, it is awesome. You can create amazing stuff. And how it'll work is, let's say, for example, you guys, as you're looking, you're photographing me, right, with a flash. So you would then meter off the scene, which is not just me, it's the entire frame, the wildebeest behind me here, the fish tank, and so on. You would, for example, underexpose what your camera sees. So the entire scene, myself, the wildebeest, everything will be underexposed. You then expose the flash slightly differently and, say for the, and tell the flash to overexpose slightly. Now, it won't bring, let's say I underexpose my camera by one and I overexpose the flash by one. It's not going to um, illuminate the whole scene because the flash is not going to reach the background. It's only going to reach me. Yeah? That light's not infinite. So you can pop that flash. It'll uh, render me, your subject, nice and well exposed with the background being slightly underexposed because that's what you tell the camera to do. Yeah, that makes sense? Now, every single flash out there, every speed light has what's called a guide number. That guide number uh, reflects the strength of that flash and how far it can pop. So if, you, if, if my background in this case is what, like a meter and a half behind me, you can determine from that guide number whether it's going to reach there. That will then influence the creative process for you and say, right, I want to underexpose by three stops, make that very, very dark, overexpose my flash by two, which is going to create a scene, one of those moody, dark images where I'm well exposed and it's very dark behind me. Great for evening shots. So that's the one side of it. You have to, however, understand the equipment and expose both ways. Makes sense. So the other option for it is full flash, which I know there's, and you also asked about full flash in one of your questions. Full flash has to do with shooting the flash in the middle of the day. People don't, it doesn't make sense to them. But here's what happens. If you, again, photographing me, and the sun, for example, is falling somewhere behind me. My face is going to be in the shadows. So the entire scene will be well exposed. Well, you should expose the scene well. But the popping of the flash will then just fill in the shadows, full flash, fill in the shadows from the front. Now, where it's also very handy is if a subject is within a certain reach of you, lion, bird, uh, I don't know, what else? Uh, buffalo. If they're close enough and your flash can reach based on the guide number and your flash can reach that subject, you can get a nice little bit of catch light in the eye if the sun is not optimal. Now watch, uh, I'll drop this image in here for you. That's catch light. Yeah, see the reflection in the eye? If the sun is positioned so that it reflects out of the subject's eye into your camera, that's catch light. It adds a wonderful, wonderful bit of life, a dynamic feeling to the image. You can create that with a full flash depending on how close you are. So there's definite uses for it and something well worth playing um, like I said in the previous episode, I would, I would probably bank my shots first if you're not comfortable with flash. And once you know I've got my keepers, then I will start playing with the flash. The, um, times not to use it. I think a lot of people, uh, it's like a lot of techniques that people learn. They learn a new slow shutter technique or a new panning technique and oh my 
goodness, that's all they do then because, ah, oh, it's this new technique and I can do this. And they do the same thing again and again and again. It's boring after a while. So when not to use it, careful that every shot's not going to demand or every shot's not going to benefit from flash every single time. Also, I mean, there's certain species, if it starts getting too dark, you don't want to be flashing an elephant at two meters again and again and again and again and again, and you know what I mean, at a close distance. I mean, if I put a flash on you and I photograph you and I flash you again and again and again, you're going to get pissed off and you're going to throw my car over. So there's obviously certain ethical rules with certain animals, but your guide in the field should be able to guide you accordingly. But overall, I mean, yeah, definitely. Is there space in the bag? Yes, definitely space in the bag for it. Um, and, I mean, there's a lot of details. Around. If you have, for example, if you have, and again, if you have certain images that you've seen, send them to me and let's try and do an autopsy on it and see how that would be done. But let me wrap this one up because I'm waffling a bit. So yes, there is space for it in the bag. Important thing is, understand you have to do camera and flash exposures in your head and then combine them and also then just what you're trying to achieve. But yeah, get a flash, play with it, it's good fun. Michael asks, how do you manage client expectations when you're dealing with an unpredictable product? For example, you don't see cats on a trip. Michael, this is another great question because it is something that comes up a lot in what I do, in what Wild Eye does, is <laughs> people book on a great migration safari and they say, oh, can you guarantee a crossing? Of course I can't guarantee a crossing. It's not gonna work like that. Um, someone comes with me to Sabi Sands, for example, to photograph leopards because that's, they fall out of the trees there most of the time. Can I guarantee a leopard sighting? No, I can't. <laughs> so here's the thing, is if you're in the position that we are in, that we take people to these great places to create experiences for them, to teach them about photography, to inspire them and to help them get images. Yes, on my website, on my brochure, and anybody who does this game, if everybody tells you else they're lying, yeah? Anybody else who's in this game will put stuff out there and they will say to you, right, we're going to go and photograph the big cats of the Masamara. I'm pretty certain in three days I'm going to find you big cats in the Masamara. But, but there's always that outside chance that you might not find it. Uh, you've seen the Hunger Games, yes? May the odds be ever in your favor. So it is a game of odds. However, what we do is we try and stack the odds so heavily in your favor that what we promise you as far as what you're going to get out in the field is not a certainty, but it's damn close. For example, you're not going to go to the Masamara in April and expect to see a, a migration crossing, yeah? You'd be stupid to because the herds aren't there. You could get lucky and, and I don't know, four confused wildebeest might charge through the dry Mara River. You've seen a crossing. But it's not the same thing. If you want to see crossings, August and September is prime time because that's when it happens. For the last... 24, 25 years, that has been the peak of it. Then, place yourself close to the action. Get good guides. And but, um, hmm, I'm not just talking about us, well, us as well, but, but the local guides, the guys who knows the lay of the land, they know the animals of the area. Each cat, they have territories. These guys will know those kind of things. Go out, make sure you don't have to come back to the lodge for breakfast because that leopard might, is gonna come down the tree, it's inevitable. But if you come back to the lodge for breakfast, you're going to miss that shot. So look at what it is that you can do out in the field. Stack the odds as heavily as you can in your favor, which should, and again, it's, not, it's never a guarantee, but it's going to give you a much better chance. Um, Gear, if you're watching this, you were with, on Big Cats with me last year. Now, Big Cats in Tuskers is Big Cats of the Masamara, Amboseli for Elephants, and for Kilimanjaro. Guess what? We didn't see the mountain once in four days because it was covered with, 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 uh, with clouds. But my brochure, my website says, ooh, we're going to see the mountain. Look, here's a pretty picture I took. It's nature. You cannot predict these things. Same thing. We wanted to photograph Lake Amboseli, huge dried crack piece of um, dry lake bed within Amboseli. It's always dry. It's always dusty. It's always cracked earth. Except when we got there last year, the day before there was 100 mils of rain. So, yeah, some people were upset and we had a chat about it. Those are the things we cannot control. But the things that you control, Michael, I mean... If you want to photograph wild dogs, um, I wouldn't go to the Kruger as my first option because it's a huge ass piece of property to look through. Look at places where they're known for it. Medikwe, there's Venetia, go to Mana Pools, go to Laikipia in Kenya. So stack the odds based on what you want to do. That's about as much as it is. But, and I'm gonna just bring us back now, the your question is about 
client expectations. And that is what we do. I'm not sure what you do, Michael. I mean, if you run trips, you're in the same game. Is guiding, photographic guiding, photographic safaris, is not about the photography. Yeah. I get a lot of people sending me emails saying, Ooh, I would love to come and work for Wild Eye. It's great. It's dynamic. It's whatever else. And then they send me 15 images or here's a portfolio of my work. It's great. There's a lot of shit hot photographers out there, but they might have the personality of a wet toilet roll. And this is a people's game. It's about managing people's expectations. From the moment you make contact on email, on the phone, at a coffee shop, all the way through to hugging at the airport when you're done. So it's a people's game. It's, yes, you need to be a good photographer. Yes, you need to understand how all of that works. Yes, you need to be a qualified guide, and I strongly believe that. You need to be a qualified guide to run photo safaris. Um, you need to be an experienced guide, but that's the tip of the iceberg. Everything else is about how you manage the people. So, Michael, if you're good with people, if you can manage the people within um, the sphere of the photographic safari industry and make them excited about what they're going to see and get them, yeah, raise their expectations and stuff, but always manage it and make sure, because nature is nature, always expect the unexpected when you go out there. So yeah, how to manage client's expectations? Exactly that, manage it. I think that's the short version. Um, and may the odds always be in your favor. <laughs> Had to do that. Right, that's it. Epilo ep uh, episode, I almost got that. I'll, I'll leave it in. Um, episode 11 is in the bag. And um, it's only four questions, but I think there's some pretty nice stuff in there. I like those kind of questions, guys. Keep them coming. Simon, I got a nice email from you yesterday. There's some awesome questions, which I'll do as well. Now, remember, I want Lightroom questions, please. I want post-processing questions. Drop me that email. Here's the address again. And give me, and in the subject line, Jerry, please answer my question and then fire away. And we'll do one episode dedicated purely just to processing of wildlife images. Now, before I let you go for the weekend, I have a question for you. We've done a lot of, this must be about five and a half, six hours worth of content on these Q&A videos out there. So I'm gonna start asking questions of you now. And I would love to hear from you. I know, I see you guys liking the things, reposting it, commenting, asking questions, emails, whatever, saying how wonderful it is. Take five seconds and let me know, my question of the day to you is, where in the world are you watching these videos from? Where is home base? Where are you sitting having a coffee, cup of coffee, with me and watching these Q&A videos? Leave a comment on YouTube, Facebook, hit me up on Instagram, wherever it is, and tell me where you are watching these videos from. Next week, three episodes coming up, one of them hopefully on the processing side of things, but that's it for me from this week. My name is Jerry, I'm from Wild Eye. You guys have a great weekend. I will see you next time.